Thomas M. Ewell was director and professor at the Gaylord Institute for Environmental Studies from 1993 to 2003 after a distinguished career that offered him research opportunities in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Ewell worked with the World Bank in La Paz, Bolivia, and was acting director of the Center for Livestock and International Development. He's held a variety of academic positions at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 1972 to 1993, including Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Training, Professor of Pathobiological Sciences, and Chair of the Department of Veterinary Science, and during which time he researched in Columbia. A civil service assignment focused on the ecology of viruses in tropical Southeast Asia uh, from 1966 to 1968, as well as experience as a captain at Walter Reed Army Institute of, Medi uh, Institute of Research in the Development of Virus Diseases, where he studied arthropod-borne viruses, including field studies on vertebrate res reservoirs and related laboratory biological management and serological work. He, uh, Yule received a BS in wildlife management with a minor in zoology and botany from Utah State University and both an MS and a PhD in wildlife ecology, veterinary science, and virology from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Professor Yule's topic today is Emerging Diseases in the Tropics, Biology Meets Economics, Politics, and Culture. We're very pleased. Uh, he has a very busy schedule, and uh, we appreciate very much his time as well as Professor Ted Lyon, our coordinator for Latin American Studies, who uh, keyed us in on his good work. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Professor Thomas Yule. <laughs> Thank you, Corey, for that uh, warm introduction, and I want to thank you and, and Ted for providing me the opportunity to come here this afternoon and talk to you about some really horrible diseases over the lunch hour <laughs> to a captive audience. And I see Professor Savage is back standing by the door to keep anybody from getting out. Uh, new diseases keep popping up, and it always seems to take us by surprise. But the thing that I find surprising is that we're surprised because, after all, this has been going on, the emergence or reemergence of these diseases, since uh, recorded history, really, at least in uh, Western history. In order to put this in some sort of context, uh, the, the uh, examples that I'm going to give you, um, I suggest that we need to face some reality. And uh, the first one is that these disease-causing organisms are component parts of ecosystems. They're out there. The problem is some of my favorite viruses are so tiny you can't see them. If they were the size of basketballs and day glow, or day glow orange in color, you'd believe it, that they're really out there lurking to get us. Second, that we human beings are part of ecosystems too. Just because we're really special mammals, we have opposable thumbs, complex brains, the power of speech, doesn't exempt us from some of the rules and regulations that nature imposes on all living things. <clears throat> Ecosystem changes, and they are changing rapidly, favor the appearance of some disease. The good news is it also means that some others are likely to be eliminated as ecosystems change. Human activity is the major driving force in ecological change today. <clears throat> there are now about 6.3 billion of us doing things every day in our everyday lives that alter and change ecosystems. We are causing one of the greatest mass extinctions of species, biological species, in the history of living things on the planet. And those changes have consequences in terms of the diseases that appear and jump up and bite us. We need control policies that and strategies that will help us to deal with these diseases. 
so that we're not so surprised or when things pop up, we know how to react and to begin to deal with them instead of becoming panicked. I'd like to pose six different situations that lead to the emergence or reemergence of diseases in the tropics and give you some examples of each of these. The first one, the situation is where there are catastrophic diseases that have sort of faded into the background, but they're still out there. Uh, when you go to Philadelphia anymore or to the southeastern United States, you don't worry about getting yellow fever and dying. And yet there were massive epidemics in the United States in the late 1700s and into the 1800s. Yellow fever is what caused the failure of the initial French attempt to construct the Panama Canal, for example. The World Health Organization classifies yellow fever as a major time bomb. And I'll explain why that is. It hasn't gone away. It's still there. And now we find it primarily in tropical forests in South America, fortunately not Central America, South America and Africa. It hangs out in tropical rainforests, and here's a picture. It's hard to take a picture of a rainforest, but here's one, and it's typical. What you see are some a few emergent trees, a very solid canopy, and there is life going on in that canopy that's restricted there. It's sort of a world unto itself. And what is it that you find there? You find primates that are roving around, and you find this beautiful mosquito with the euphonious name of Hemagogus janthanomys. Somebody should write a song with that in it. <laughs> and it turns out that Hemagogus janthanomys and another uh, genus, Sabethes, are very efficient vectors of the yellow fever virus. So this is a virus that grows in the mosquito. The mosquitoes acquire it from an infected monkey. It grows in the mosquito, and then the mosquito passes it along to usually another infected monkey or other vertebrates. But all of this is going on in the canopy top. And if you're walking down on the forest floor with the treetops, the cycle going on 30 meters or more above your head, you would be totally unaware of it unless you saw spider monkeys and howler monkeys dropping dead out of the trees. That would be a clue that yellow fever was going on up there. So if somebody walking through the forest is isolated from that, are they really at risk? And the answer is, well, not very. But the problem comes at the agricultural frontier where with the tremendous pressure on land and cutting the primary rainforest, the trees are brought down to ground level, or if you're a logger and you're hauling out timber, the trees come down, and it doesn't take much imagination to see that the mosquitoes that were up there, when the tree comes down and brings them down with them, would wake up. And if they're hungry, and she is looking for another primate, and you happen to cut down the tree, you'd be it. And so that's how yellow fever makes it out of the forest, canopy into people. Then the question comes, well, that produces little isolated outbreaks. In fact, just last week there was one in the Yungas in Bolivia. There was a case of this forest yellow fever. And uh, the problem comes with, isn't this a gorgeous mosquito? It's black and silver. And this is Aedes aegypti. And this is the one that is the sort of the equivalent of the dog of the mosquito world. It lives in and immediately around houses. It's also a very efficient vector of yellow fever. And this is what caused the outbreaks in Philadelphia, the southeast, and Panama and the Panama Canal. And it's the scary part that makes yellow fever the time bomb 
uh, that WHO designates it because this mosquito is all over the tropics and it's a very efficient yellow fever vector. So if the individual who gets bitten in the forest comes to town, finds Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, then there's the potential for very rapid spread from person to mosquito to person in rapid epidemic form. And it's, that has been more of a problem in Africa than it has been in Latin America, although the risk is still there. And here in this table, you see some of the recent major outbreaks. Now, these aren't just the little ones with the odd case now and then, but these are major, major outbreaks involving hundreds and sometimes thousands of cases. And that raises an interesting point in terms of sort of public health strategy. Why is it more explosive? Has it been more explosive in Africa than it has been in Latin America? And I think the, the basically the answer is money, that health systems are better supported and the whole economic situation is better in most parts of Latin America. So that even individuals out in, in more remote villages are more likely to have been vaccinated against yellow fever than people in remote areas in Africa. Just for curiosity's sake, I want to do a quick survey. How many of you have been vaccinated against yellow fever? Wow, good number. Uh, and smart, too, I should say. One of the very best virus vaccines there is. Well, there's this good vaccine. Why isn't it getting into people? And it's a matter of cost and the relative economic levels, particularly in the more remote rural areas where yellow fever is likely to become a problem. So the strategy in Latin America has been more to try to maintain reasonable vaccination coverage, even in rural areas. And that's why I suspect the recent case last week in Bolivia is not likely to go anywhere. The individual went up to La Paz and died in the hospital there, and La Paz is so high and cold, Aedes aegypti can't live there. But uh, in the uh, tropics and uh, semi-tropics of the area in the Yungas, uh, north and a little east of La Paz, there's potential for spread, but uh, so far the, the news is good. What's kind of scary is um, about two months ago, there were isolated cases in the Ivory Coast. And if you've been following what's been happening in the Ivory Coast, there's been a civil war going on and the country is now divided into the rebel-held areas and the government-held areas. And the scary part was that there was a case in each one of those and the question is, could public health authorities, which are almost always governmental, sometimes non-governmental organizations are active, like uh, Doctors Without Borders, could they get into the rebel-held area and begin to vaccinate? Because that's the strategy that's employed in Africa. They wait for some cases, they rush in, they vaccinate everybody in the, in the vicinity, in hopes that there'll be immunity developed quickly enough over a large enough area to halt any major outbreaks. Uh, it's worked imperfectly. As a result, there have been hundreds, in some cases thousands of cases before they managed to get on top of it. The, uh, of course, the population trends in Africa with very high rates of population growth means that a very large percentage of the population are under age 15 and have never been vaccinated. So there is this constant replenishment of susceptible individuals. And this gives you an idea of where the urban outbreaks are. And that's where the real danger is, in a group like this, where the mosquito can get from person to person to person quickly and efficiently, is where these major outbreaks are most damaging. And so you can see from the circles that the time bomb, bomb is ticking most loudly in Africa, although it's still a major concern in South America, too. The second situation is we think we keep finding new diseases when, in fact, 
the things that cause them have really been out there all along. It just means that there have been changes that set the scene for these diseases to become a problem, and we now have the technology to recognize them more rapidly than before. And here is lowland Bolivia. The disease there is Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, which popped up in the early 60s, had never been recognized before, but was associated with human settlement in the tropical lowlands. And these areas, as you can see, this is the, the Beni in lowland Bolivia. It's in the watershed of the Amazon River, and it's quite uh, low down, two to 300 meters above sea level, but does undergo a seasonal flooding. In fact, right now, today, that area is being flooded. And what happens is you can see the wet areas here is that whole area becomes flooded. And when that happens, the rodents that live there look for higher ground. I mean, after all, wouldn't you? And when they do, that's where the people are that are beginning to settle in this relatively remote area. And their houses, their dwellings are not rodent-proof, so the rodents move in. That's where the food is, and that's where the shelter is. And unfortunately, they urinate and excrete into the food sources or into the environment, and they pass a virus along, Machupo, which causes hemorrhagic fever, and depending on the quality of the, the health care, kills between 10 and 30 percent of the people who get it. So uh, if one controls rodents, one can control the disease, but there's no way, at least with the technology we have now, that that disease will ever be eradicated in the rodent population. So it's a matter of what people do, and the pressure for land, which is so pervasive all across the tropics, bringing people into areas that puts them at risk to these diseases. Another one that's really scary, and for those of you who've read The Hot Zone, you know about Ebola virus. It's one of the more ghastly diseases um, that are circulating now. It uh, is a serious hemorrhagic disease. It kills upwards of 80% of the people who become infected and they die a horrible death. They sort of bleed out of all their pores and orifices and die. And this is Kikwit in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which all of a sudden popped up and it became a hospital-centered epidemic. This is an isolated, very rural, rudimentary hospital run by Belgian nuns, and they're way out in the boonies with very limited resources, doing their very best to look after these people. And what happens is they don't have good containment facilities for patients with really bad infectious diseases. Their sterilization me measures aren't always adequate, and the result was Somebody came into the hospital with Ebola virus, and then it began to be spread within the hospital. But it was also exacerbated by cultural practices. And we biology guys sometimes forget how critically important these things are in the epidemiology and transmission of some of these terrible diseases. And what was happening was that when a patient would die in the hospital, the family would come. In fact, very often, it's the family that provides the nursing care, so they're exposed. And so here these patients are covered with blood that's, that's full of virus. And so the patient's family comes, they bring them home, and the cultural practice is to wash the body before burial. And so here they are. Here's this dead person covered with a thin veneer a virus, and you can imagine washing the body and the exposure that would bring to the people involved in that. And so one of the very, very hard things that they had to try to do was to change this very deeply held cultural practice. Imagine, it would be like somebody telling us, 
if one of your loved ones died, I'm sorry, you can't have anything to do with that individual anymore. And that's essentially what they did. So they wrapped these dead patients up, and then the family wasn't even permitted to go to the burials. This was done by a, tr a crew with protective clothing. So it's a really scary kind of situation. And, uh, but effectively, they were able to get people to understand what was going on. And this is really hard in isolated remote populations that don't have a really good concept of the germ theory of disease. In fact, that turned out to be, last year, a serious problem in the Republic of the Congo, other side of the river, Brazzaville, where there was a little outbreak of uh, Ebola virus. The Doctors Without Borders, who a group that I admire very much, rushed in to try to help people stop the epidemic so it didn't get transmitted from person to person. The people in this isolated village, after a few people had died after the Doctors Without Frontiers had arrived, came to the conclusion that it was the Doctors Without Borders that were casting evil spells on them. And they were run out of town at the risk of their lives. They were stoned. And it was only until people from the Congo, the Congolese came in and did a serious education program to explain to people what was really going on, that they were finally able to move in and get people to give up washing and burying their own dead. But uh, it cost them many lives because that took time, and while that was going on, transmission was continuing. And for those of us who love wildlife, just as a side issue, it turns out that Ebola is having a serious effect on the great apes in that part of West and Central Africa. Uh, lowland gorillas and chimpanzees, particularly bonobos, which is a, a race which incidentally genetically is very close to us, have had numbers very significantly reduced and Already their habitat is threatened by human development. So one of the concerns as a conservation issue is that Ebola virus would ultimately lead to the extinction of great apes in that part of Africa. And that indeed would be tragic. Another virus that's been out there all along, and I'm sorry, this is kind of a fuzzy picture of pigs, but you've all seen pigs, so you know what they look like. And uh, What's happen, what was happening in the Malaysian Peninsula, in the Malay Peninsula, is the development of more intensive agricultural practices, and this is economically driven. Uh, so instead of having just a few backyard pigs, they're now raising pigs uh, in a more commercial scale in, uh, under uh, confinement conditions. And of course, you've got people taking care of the pigs, and you've got all these pigs together, and then to make the scene complete, there are giant fruit bats. And uh, these are wonderful bats. Their bodies are almost the size of footballs. I mean, they really are big. Their wing spread is about like that. And uh, so the pig farmers were planting fruit trees around the piggeries. And that makes sense because if you have pigs, inevitably you have pig fertilizer, right? That's just the way life is. And so to put that to use, instead of having it a waste product to make it a something of value, they're fertilizing their fruit orchards. So you have juxtaposition of fruit trees, giant fruit bats, which eat fruit, and pigs all together. Well, it turns out that these bats have and probably have had for maybe millennia a virus called Nipah. And so the virus, the bats put, when they're eating fruit, you know, some of the fruit drops into the pig pens or gets tossed into the pig pens, then the pigs get the virus, and the pigs start dying of a very serious hemorrhagic disease. And then the, the pig guys that are managing these pig farms are in there, and they're 
taking care of the sick and dying pigs, and then they get it, and they start getting sick and dying. And so this is a, a situation that has simply been created by human activity driven by economic opportunity. There's no vaccine for this, at least not yet. In Bangladesh, the same virus is there. It's probably prevalent over most of Southeast Asia, but hasn't been recognized yet everywhere that the bat occurs. I remember standing in a, a temple grounds in southeastern Thailand where there was a roost of these giant fruit bats, and, and there's bat urine and stuff right, sort of raining down on us, and we're looking up at the bats, and I now if that curls my hair if I had any, uh, thinking of we were probably uh, exposed to it. But in Bangladesh, it's a little bit different. Uh, it skips the pigs because Bangladesh is a Muslim country, so there's a cultural religious practice that has to do with what goes on there. So there's not an amplification cycle through pigs, but rather the bats come in and they eat fruit, and they don't they're not part of the clean plate club. I mean, they're not like your, they don't, their moms aren't like yours that say, you've got to clean your plate. Uh, and so they would eat a little bit on a fruit, and then they'd go off and eat another one, and the fruit would be hanging or still just with a few bites out of it on the ground. And then there is another primate in the area, which are called small children. And children climb trees, as many of you probably did, and eat fruit. And they pick up what looks like pretty good fruit off the ground and eat it. And the problem is that the bats have contaminated the fruit. And so now there have been small repeated outbreaks of Nipah virus infections, primarily in children, in Bangladesh. And one wonders how many other places that's going on. And then there's SARS. Do you remember SARS? It was, what, four or five years ago? In fact, we had a program going on in China when it was SARS was sort of raging there. And we essentially canceled our trips for a year, waiting for it to die down. And people were saying, well, we know it goes from person to person, and there are some hot spots. There was one apartment building in Hong Kong where everybody seemed to be getting it. But there were also scattered cases. And so the question with these kinds of situations is, where is it? And then they discovered that it was tied into another cultural and economic practice, which is the live animal market. And for how many of you have been in China? Okay, well, there are all sorts of really unusual things to eat there. Sort of anything that moves gets eaten. And uh, one of their fried wasps are my favorite, but... One of the things they do is you go, can go into a live market, and this is a palm civet, and it's an animal kind of like that. And if you want to have palm civet for Sunday dinner, you go pick out your palm civet, take it home, cut it up, kill it, kill it cut it up, and eat it. And so there are all these animals that come in together. And so the SARS virus was initially identified as coming from the palm civets, but a lot of these palm civets are raised in farms now rather than being caught in the wild. And so they said, well, it probably isn't being initially, I mean, the, the focus for maintenance probably isn't there. It's got to be somewhere else. And so you do the usual thing that those of us that do these kinds of crazy things do is you go out and you start catching everything to see who's got the virus. And uh, a team that was in there started studying bats, had a look at bats, and lo and behold, the SARS virus is harbored in the horseshoe bat, and that's where it's maintained. And it isn't altogether clear yet how it gets from the bats into these farm-raised palm civets, but clearly that seems to be happening. So undoubtedly out there for a long time, it just took the right set of circumstances for it to finally get into human populations. And then once that happened, it could go from person to person uh, fairly easily. The third situation is you know, we try to make things better. You know, we really do 
I think, have a commitment to looking after the ark on which we're sailing through space to take good care of it. And so we try to manage it because we're smart. You know, we, we should be able to do that. But sometimes when we do that, unexpected things happen. And so, okay, here's the situation. And imagine if you had to make the decision. So this is sub-Sahelian Africa, West Africa. And what do you know? You know, you have an extremely long dry season and sometimes years of drought that get to be really critical. So one of the things that you'd really worry about would be food security, people simply having enough to eat. And that's tied to water. So if you were a development officer working in that part of Africa, you'd say water, food, rice. And if you could put in good water control structures along the more permanently flowing rivers to use for irrigation, like we do in Utah, then wouldn't that be the solution? Fortunately, in Senegal, the French Overseas Development Organization recognized that there might be some disease-associated problems with it, so they brought an expert in to assess the situation, and he said, you run a significant risk of creating a situation where Rift Valley fever could be a problem. Well, why would you worry about Rift Valley fever? Well, one, because it's death on small ruminants, sheep and goats, which are a big economic component part of agricultural systems all over Africa. And second, it also infects and kills people. Um, not in massive numbers like yellow fever would, but still in significant numbers. So here's the dilemma. Do you let people starve to death? Or do you go ahead with your project and recognize that if Rift Valley fever popped up, there is a vaccine for animals, so you could do something there, but there's no vaccine for humans that's approved. What would you do? I mean, over a period of a decade, there's very high probability that people would, in fact, starve to death because of drought. So they went ahead and, and built the infrastructure for improving rice cultivation, improved the, the situation in terms of food availability, and sure enough, they had periodic small focal problems with Rift Valley fever. It's transmitted by mosquitoes. So they would have outbreaks that would kill their small ruminants and occasionally people. And uh, we faced this. We had a, the University of Wisconsin had a uh, project, rural development project in the Gambia, which is this funny little country that sticks into Senegal. If you conjure up a mental map of Africa, sort of like a Caribbean island but with water in the middle. And uh, one of the things, again, to deal with this problem of food availability was to try to provide better situations for women to have more effective household gardens, very important for feeding the families. And so the dilemma was if they were to dam up some of these lower-lying areas that are, that are seasonally wet during the rainy season, then there would be more vegetables and more family and the women could generate some income uh, as well as feeding their families better but with the risk of creating a situation where Rift Valley fever could become a problem. So far it hasn't but the risk is still there. Rift is a much bigger problem in West Africa uh, maybe a little less associated with human activity in terms of, of ecological change because that's sort of Rift Valley fever's natural habitat. And in the last two months, there has been a roaring outbreak that started in northeastern uh, Kenya and has spread. It started out in this area, spread throughout Kenya, and just last week was reported now in Tanzania. And it's also gotten into the southern region of Somalia. And you know what's going on there with the Ethiopian army and the Somali uh, 
government now having driven out the Islamic court government and so there's all of this movement of people down to areas along the Kenyan Somalian border and this is an area that's been flooding lately so there are lots of mosquitoes and now Rift Valley fever has gotten in and has begun to create really serious health problems on both sides of the border. Well you can deal with it on the Kenya side but as the, the latest report I read yesterday said we're having trouble dealing with the situation in southern Somalia due to the difficult political situation. Well, it's difficult because people are running around shooting at each other. And if you're a public health person, uh, that certainly is a difficult and uncomfortable situation. And so people, uh, health people just aren't going in there for obvious reasons. The fourth situation is old diseases move to new areas. You know, we, we tend to have sort of a frozen snapshot in our mind of where diseases ought to be and that that always ought to be that way. Well, that's not the way life is. And an example there is dengue virus, which is a very uncomfortable disease. Uh, not all that many people die. A few do. Uh, fairly high mortality rates for kids, little kids that get it in Southeast Asia. But it used not to be in the Western Hemisphere until about 1962, and it showed up in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean islands. And now it's just all over the place. And again, it gets back. This is the same f mosquito that transmits yellow fever. It's our old buddy, Aedes aegypti again. And now there's just dengue, dengue all over the place. So uh, all the red areas are dengue areas. It was... You know, 30 years ago, a problem mainly in Southeast Asia and Africa, and now it's all over the tropical areas of Central and South America, Mexico, and the mosquito is present in the southeastern United States. There was a WHO-financed program to control Aedes aegypti in Latin America, and it was really successful in some countries. Colombia had been extremely successful with their program in the 1950s, 60s, and into the 70s. And then the WHO money started to dry up, and so the, the Colombian politicians had to ask themselves, we're spending all this money to control a mosquito that is only present, oops, get my map back, only present in a little focus along the Colombian-Venezuelan border. All the rest of the country had been cleared of Aedes aegypti. A tremendous achievement. But imagine if you were a politician and you said, gosh, are we going to spend thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars controlling a mosquito that isn't there anymore when we have such demands for rural electrification, building schools, building roads, and improving our infrastructure. So they abandoned it. And, and they forgot to tell the mosquitoes that they were supposed to stay put in Venezuela. And so they came, indocumentados, into, see, they don't have to carry passports, so they can fly a long way, into Colombia. They reinfested the whole coastal plain. And in about 1974, the city of Santa Marta, which is located on the, oops, sorry on the Caribbean right about here, had half a million cases of dengue in a space of about six months. So the success of the program spelled its doom, and that is an economic problem, and it's a political problem as well. And then, of course, when you know well, and even though this isn't exactly tropical, it's right here in our own backyard, and that's West Nile virus. I mean, it was a, a sort of subtropical Caribbean Middle Eastern virus that was endemic in that area, and it pops up in the middle of New York City. I mean, who'd have thunk it? Um, nobody was expecting that, and then it spread. Now it's all over the uh, lower 48 states into Canada, and it's moving down into Mexico and the Caribbean islands. And we have it. We had our biggest West Nile year ever in Utah this past year. How many of you have horses? I hope you have them vaccinated against West Nile virus. 
it, it does a bad number on, on horses as well as on people, particularly older people. And there's no human vaccine yet, but there's one in the works. Fifth situation is boring old diseases become hot topics, you know. Uh, gosh, you know, plague was a big deal, especially back in the 1300s. Ravished Europe, killed 25% of the population. But, you know, do you just lose a lot of sleep when you go to Europe about plague? Not anymore. But just because it isn't doing what it used to do doesn't mean that it's gone. And the place it's hanging out now is in the tropics. And so this is the bubo part of bubonic plague. It's, a, it's an inguinal lymph node that's full of bacteria. And without treatment, this person is likely to die. It's harbored in rats with whom we live with great affection and their fleas. And it goes from flea to rat to flea and then occasionally to people. And it is still a problem in some parts of the world most recently in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where there are all these desperately poor people that have these illegal mines that are trying to mine either diamonds or gold or other minerals in these artisanal mining operations. And they're packed in there together under very close quarters. And under these circumstances, plague, and it's what decimated a lot of Europe during the Black Death, can go, if it gets in your lungs, and you cough, it goes from person to person to person fairly rapidly with, without treatment, which, of course, these miners in the Congo aren't getting. They were dying like flies. And so plague is still out there lurking. So if you're going to be a miner in the eastern Congo, besides taking a bulletproof vest, you want to take antibiotics. The sixth and last situation is truly new diseases do appear. And one of my favorites is Venezuelan equine encephalitis, which has been a constant periodic problem in northern South America, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador. And horses are still a big deal there. And here's one that, that works for a living. It's carrying sugar cane. And here's another that is somebody's connection to the larger markets and the larger communities as a form of transportation. And when they get this disease, this virus, about 80% of the horses that get it die. Not very many people die, less than 1%. The problem is if you have thousands of human cases, not only does it fill up your hospital at great economic cost, but even with a 0.8% case fatality rate, that's still a lot of dead people, mainly kids. So, well, why is this a problem? Because there's a good vaccine for this and the answer, again, is really more economic and logistical and political organization than anything because this is a live virus. It's very sensitive to heat. You have to keep it cool the whole time. So if you're down on the coastal plain in Colombia or Venezuela and the temperature is 40 degrees centigrade, you know, pushing 95 to 100 degrees, if your virus vaccine is sitting out for very long at all, it's dead and then it won't work. So it's a matter of getting things organized, getting people to bring their horses to one place, getting them vaccinated. All that takes time, money, and political organization. And the problem is it comes only infrequently, which means that it gets forgotten from one epidemic to the next. And then there's the one we are worried about now, which is avian influenza. And I won't say much about it, other than now it has been reported in 10 countries, mainly in Southeast Asia. Why do we worry? There have only been, you know, a couple of hundred people dead of it. You know, that's not a great heap of dead people. And, and the worry is that somehow it will mutate, and these influenza virus does mutate at a fairly high rate, or that it will recombine with a human influenza, sort of mix and match their genetic material, and suddenly become transmissible and as deadly as the 1918 flu, which killed, depending on whose figures you believe, between 20 and 50 million people in 1917, 18, and 19, 1920. And that was before airplanes were flying people all over the world. So stay tuned. This is one that may come to haunt us yet. And then there's mad disease, cow, mad cow disease, and I won't say much about it. It's not particularly a tropical problem. Fortunately, the Brits got on top of it, as did the Europeans. 
So it's unlikely to move into Africa. And my concern is, you know, things move both ways from temperate zones into tropical zones, just as they do from tropical to temperate. So we don't have mad cows here. We have cows without much of a sense of humor. They get cranky, but so far. And then, of course, the biggie in terms of social economic impacts is AIDS. And in Africa, I mean, this is the quintessential problem for political, economic, and social, cultural influences on, on a very, very terrible disease with an extremely high death rate. And a high proportion of individuals in Africa have it. And I was in uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo a year ago, September, and, and it's not as severely impacted as South Africa and, and uh, some other uh, African countries. But knowing that one in every 10 to 12 people that I saw on the street would be dead in five to 10 years is really sobering. Imagine the social economic consequences where there are uh, infection rates of 30 to 40 percent. Uh, a truly scary situation. Well, on that cheerful note, uh, so what and what's to do? Uh, quickly, you've got to figure out what's there and how important it is. Then you've got to figure out what to do about it once you decide you really do want to do something about it. And it's got to be doable, so it has to be epidemiologically sound. And that's been one of the big problems with AIDS is trying to get people to change behavior and to provide them with uh, drugs to help treat their AIDS. And it's just very hard to do. It has to be socially acceptable. And we've talked about some of the examples there. And it has to be affordable. And that's one of the big problems in developing countries today. Last, you have to put together a fairly sophisticated uh, integrated system that detects cases, makes decisions on treating them, and does follow-up. And that's what's usually missing in developing countries. And so... I thank you for your kind attention. I hope I haven't taken your appetite away for lunch. Here are some of the diseases that are out there now. And I'll tell you what, come back in 30 years right here, and we'll see what the new diseases are, because there will be some waiting for you. I guess they've already tried uh, DEET in Africa with the um, mosquitoes, because it seems like mosquitoes are the big problem with the, uh, the rift Valley mm -hmm. disease and all, all those other diseases. Can you comment on that? Is, is DEET a problem? Is it expensive, or do they not know how to work it? Uh, no, I, I think people know how to work it. It's simple, you know, a simple external application. Getting it out to the area where it needs to go would be the hard part, and then getting people to use it uh, whose you know, systems of personal hygiene are very different from ours. And uh, so, yes, it would help, but getting it applied massively would be hard. Uh, we have a gentleman in the balcony. One of the things we hear a great deal about these days is concern over preserving wetlands. Mm -hmm. How much of a problem is wetlands preservation in terms of mosquito management? Uh, that's really a great question because that's you, you, we get the conservation people. I mean, the, the figures are absolutely convincing that wetlands are disappearing at a, at a great rate. And the, the value that they have now is, uh, is a significant one. And it's one of those situations where if one were to reestablish or recreate wetlands, then one would need to take into account the fact that undoubtedly these are good areas where mosquitoes would grow. Um, I mean, you look at the rice fields in Southeast Asia with Japanese encephalitis. These are artificial wetlands. At least they're flooded part of the year. And there's a mosquito that comes, that breeds in those in terrific numbers. If you add fish to eat the mosquitoes, you're okay. If you don't do that, then you can have trouble with the mosquitoes carrying the virus from birds to people or birds to pigs. Um, I was in Mexico last week talking with some colleagues about how to set up ecologically responsible wetlands, artificial wetlands for, for sewage treatment, sewage effluents. So trying to get away from very expensive uh, 
traditional infrastructure for, for wastewater treatment. And if they were to decide to go ahead with that, it, they had better build in some considerations on mosquito control. And there are ways to do this that don't require uh, heavy-duty chemicals uh, to prevent those kinds of problems from coming up. You know, they've done this very effectively in California. So uh, that's a great question, and, and the problem is, you know, if you've got a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so if you're a conservation guru and you're really worried about west, wetlands and there's lots of reasons to worry and you want to do something good about it, then you better have some friends who can help you out with the potential disease problems that might emerge. There are some other disease problems, too, that might pop up, not so much in Mexico, but uh, particularly in places like Africa, where you might build a situation as occurred in the Nile Delta with the appearance of schistosomiasis, which is a fluke, a liver fluke, that's devastating for human health. And when they cut off the Nile flooding, then they had more stable water, they had snails, they had schistosomiasis. And uh, lots of people predicted that would happen, but the technology wasn't there to prevent it, so it's a problem. Yes, one in the back. It seems to me that uh, a lot of the uh, momentum and funding in public health is disease-specific. Uh, maybe polio eradication and AIDS are examples of that. Can you comment on the effectiveness of disease-specific interventions versus health systems development? Uh, yeah, it's easier to make a really compelling, urgent case for specific diseases, AIDS, uh, Malaria, which is still a you know a big killer, particularly in Africa, and and go after it, and with the sort of the attitude, which I think is short-sighted, to say, well, putting together this system, this health system, that involves surveillance and then prudent reaction to it, and ongoing efforts, is the responsibility of the government. And very few external funders, you know, are willing to take on that long-term commitment. They say, you know, that's a responsibility of the state. And so you get the Gates Foundation that's pouring millions, billions, really, into malaria right now and AIDS in Africa. And I'm not aware that they're doing anything in terms of helping to develop this long-term system that's going to be required that once you get on top of these things, assuming you can do it, that things will stay in good functional condition. So that's a great question, and unfortunately, it just it isn't as glamorous as sort of going out there and people are dying and animals are dying. It's exciting, and you want to do something about it on the short term and lose sight of what it's really going to take to do something long term. Oh, okay. You're coming. Your turn's coming, Steve. Um, you mentioned that one of the problems in uh, fighting these diseases in Africa is the people who don't accept, the general population doesn't accept germ theory for, you know, being the cause of disease. And that reminded me of a case last year in South Africa where there was a government leader who seemed to fall in the same group with uh, HIV and AIDS. Do you see that as a, like, an isolated incident, or do you think that's a widespread problem where there are many, even the political leaders, you know, who don't accept germ theory? Well, it, it certainly was with Mbeki, who was the president of, of South Africa after Nelson Mandela. And he, you know, he was in deep denial there for a while that HIV virus was not connected to AIDS when there was this absolutely compelling evidence at the time there was. I think the Mbeki situation is unusual. Um, I think rather what happens is it's when you get out into rural areas and areas where people have limited or no edu formal education at all, and they have these belief systems that you have to deal with in terms of what is causing disease. Uh, we did a little project when I was living and working in Thailand up along the Burmese border with some of the hill tribes, and those people had, that the school had just recently arrived, so there were a lot of people there with no education, and and you know, the world was full of spirits, and when the spirits get out of balance, then you've, 
and make you sick, then if it's just a little problem, you sacrifice a chicken and you get the spirit back in your body. And if it's a big problem, you'd have to sacrifice a pig. And if it's a really serious problem, you might have to sacrifice a water buffalo. But it's a matter of getting education to people. And and it's hard when it counters some of these very old traditional belief systems. So you're really dealing with a matter of belief and perception, sometimes that are very deeply held. And, uh, And I think that's also the story in lots of places in Africa, particularly the more remote rural areas that have that same kind of situation. Uh, I think the bigger problem in Africa is responsible political leadership that will help develop the exact kinds of health systems that, that you, question, you, you raised questions about and investing in that instead of investing in taking care of their cronies and, and diverting money into Swiss bank accounts. This will be our last question. So it better be good, Steve. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I read recently that uh, some scientists had estimated that